want to do out in the world. And then why don't you just end with what orders and grades do I need in order to get in to that school or that range of schools. Uh, and, and again, this is a, it's a healthier experience for the students. They're gonna get more uh, out of it over the long term. And as an added bonus, when you're applying to those selective schools, that's what, that's what colleges are looking for these days. They wanna see in a personal statement, not just a kid who studied really hard all the time and stayed up all night and, and got that 5.0 and that uh, extremely high SAT score, they also want to see a student that has a sense of self and can articulate why they want to go to a particular college. Um, your number three on the college rankings list is not a good answer as to why you want to go to a particular school. They want to know that you understand the program, what that school excels at, how you'll fit in, and then what you're going to go do out in the world as a result of having gone to their school. Um, that will make that. And they, they, of course, you still do need the scores and the grades to be competitive with everyone, but now they're looking for something a little bit more, which again is that, that sense of self and being able to express that uh, through your application. Does that make sense? Okay, lots of nodding. That's good. Let's, let's dig in a little bit further. And before we get into specifics on the SAT and the ACT, I just want to give a, a brief overview of how the college admissions process has changed and how it works right now, and then where those scores and grades fit in. Before I do that, I will mention this. So I stumbled into this world uh, many, many moons ago when I was in graduate school, and there was a professor that wanted to do a research project showing that the SAT and the ACT, the two big college admissions tests, were not the ideal tools to choose who got into the country's top colleges, at least not using those things exclusively. Uh, so I got involved in this, in this project, and part of it was that at that time, the makers of those tests said it was impossible to study for these exams. Uh, and so he said, hey, let's, we've got a, a baseline, there's a little group of us, so we've got a baseline score, which is what you scored when you were in high school. Let's have you, all of you guys study for it uh, and see how high you can push those scores. Uh, and then as a result of this project, I ended up getting a, a perfect score on the SAT and kind of accidentally uh, invented a, a, a way to prepare for the exam. Um, and then after the, the research project was done, it was just people in the local community kind of heard about that score. Um, and we tried to find some, again, some healthy and positive ways to help students raise their scores. We could uh, put them in a good position to get into the schools they wanted to without putting them in a position where they've got to stay up till 3 or 4 a.m. Um, UCLA <laughs> runs 120,000 applications every single year, and it's hard. It's hard to wrap your brain around how many applications that actually is. I had a chance to sit down with the dean of admissions at UCLA, who said uh, that their their team they would love to have two hours per application. It's a really good set. Let's your son or daughter's name. Just give it a name. Yeah. That's, that's an easy one. What is it? Ziad. Z-I-A-D. Ziad. Uh, Ziad? Ziad. Ziad? Ziad? Ziad. Okay. So they want to know who Ziad is uh, beyond just a score and a GPA. And so we'd love to have two hours of study the transcript of Ziad. What's, what classes did he excel in? Uh, he says he wants to be pre-med. Well, how did he do in his science courses? Uh, and they want, to, they want to link those things up and has that tie to the personal statement, has that tie to the recommendation letters, two hours per application. And we did a little back of the napkin math. So, okay, two hours per application, 120,000 uh, applications. How long would it take to put together that one freshman class? It's going to be 127 years uh, for that, that director of admission. Now, they have a staff of 30, uh, to, be, to be fair, but it would still take more than four <laughs> years to put together one freshman class. So it's a logistical issue, really, that shifts a lot of emphasis onto the SAT and the ACT score. That is the reason that those scores, uh, even though a lot of schools are going test optional, I, I personally don't think those tests are going, they're not leaving anytime soon. Um, because this big logistical issue is not, is not gonna disappear. In fact, we see more and more families applying to the same uh, top band of, of schools because they want their kids to, to get a fantastic education. Um, and so if, if anything, it's only moving more and more in this, in this direction. 
Now on that test optional piece, um, I think it's a good thing. I think it is a, a very positive development that schools are adding and they're making it an option for students who don't excel on these exams. If they have some other way that they can shine in the process, if they've got an art portfolio or um, they've uh, done on their incredible projects, then maybe they don't need that score. But even when we look at University of Chicago and we see that they've gone test optional, it actually hasn't changed their typical student being admitted very much. There's a small percentage that get in as test optional students, um, but the majority still look a lot like the ones uh, that, that got in before the test optional process. And so uh, that, that tells me this is good to open up, open up that door to get into that school or schools like it for, a, for a, some exceptions to the rule, but for most of us, um, it's gonna operate the same way for the foreseeable future. Yes, sir. Yeah, but we, we are showing 135 on applications, right? Yeah. But now that all the colleges are using the computer to start out the application to the number, it's all number game, right? So how do you feel when you talk to them, the, what the using the program, what the selection criteria for them, to start of 150,000 applications to maybe like 40,000 applications, then go and do a, a man uh, review of the application. Well, that is the perfect transition to the very <laughs> Well, we're gonna skip past that one. Uh, I will mention this about, the, and the other thing that's pushing emphasis on the test is, is grade inflation, which this, this looked at high school grades across the nation from, that's 1991 versus the reds 2011. And it's these went down, these went down, these went down, and is making up the slack. Um, and I think there's a lot of different pressures that are creating this. Those pressures don't even, don't even matter for our discussion. It's just, it is, again, accidentally shifted emphasis on the SAT and the ACT. Um, and that, while we've got high school educators and college admissions officers, they know those tests are not laser-focused intelligence tests. They know they are not great indicators of your future capacity or potential. Um, the real value is just that everyone took the same exam. Um, because I think all students certainly know it, and, and parents as well. Even two different teachers within the same school, it's like, oh, you want to get Mr. So-and-so for uh, Calc AB because it's an easier, it's easier to get an A with that teacher. Well, then it really expands. We start comparing high schools, and we start comparing high schools from different countries. They need one standardized exam where everyone did the same thing to help gauge that, that GPA. Now the way that they use these, back to, back to your question, um, I think you can see it with this visual here. So we've got USC, uh, this is over a five year period from a, um, a private school here in Orange County. Um, it's just a, a doctored up version of Navios, which I, I understand you guys use here at Fairmont. Great tool, get in there, play with it, use it, you, you'll learn a lot from Cool. So we've got red dots were denied at USC, the green dots were accepted and decided to go to USC, and then the blue dots were accepted to USC and decided to go to another school. Does Mark look good? Okay. And then we've got our test scores are down here. So a, a um, 24 is roughly equal to an 1140 on the, on the SAT, uh, and then a 30 is equal to a 1380, and so on all the way up to a perfect score, we've got a 36. And then going up this scale is our GPA unweighted, so no one can score higher than a 4.0 on that on that GPA. Now we know what we're looking at. Okay. At any given selective school, those would be a, a, a let's say a, let's say our highly selective school. They're admitting fewer than 30 percent of of the students that apply. There's going to be a zone like this, and they refer to that as the academic standards which is generally where that GPA and test score meet. And that would be where the, the majority of students uh, fall into this range. And so if you're, and you can see here, if the, if the GPA is a little higher, maybe that test score could be a little lower or vice versa. They kind of balance it out to get in this, in this zone. And it's from there, uh, and, and I think this was what you were, you were getting at, how do they handle 120,000 applications? Well, they take the kids that are in that, meet those standards and then the ones above it, they're definitely gonna read all of those thoroughly and get into those, the, the qualitative pieces of the application. I think a wonderful development though that, that has taken place over the last few years is all the ones back here that um, parents are worried their application's just gonna get thrown away. Do you see really 
pioneered this, where they, they outsourced that reading to a, to a bigger group of readers who just have cues they're looking for in these applications. And if they see a diamond in the rough, a special story that pops out, uh, they will send it back that the head, uh, the, the chief admissions officer, and they will absolutely read that application front and back and, and take that uh, and give that kid a, a real shot at admission. So everybody does get read now. Um, and and I, that's a, it's a great development because we use for all, I have a lot of parents with young kids. When you see junior year, I mean, they really, your kids really put their like blood, sweat, and tears into those applications. Uh, and so the, the, the least these colleges could do is really read and, uh, and give everybody a fair shake. Now I'm going to turn it to you guys. What do you notice on this graph um, for the, the uh, when we've got a student back, back here, you're behind the academic stand. What do you notice about the, the colors of those dots? What's that? Denial. There are a lot of denials back there. Are they are they all are they all denials back here? No. No, no, there are fun, there are a number of kids from this school over the who were admitted behind that. Uh, and and so I don't want to give the impression that it is all about scores and grades. It's really not. There's no, there is no combo that's gonna rule you out completely. Um, and the converse is true up here. There's red up there. There is no score and, and GPA that's now an automatic admin uh, at these selected schools, right? Again, we've got to have something more. What are some things that might help a school make an exception a little bit behind the curve? So is this data part uh, taking on the legacy? No. I mean, a lot of private schools no. do a lot of legacy admissions. That would be an exception, right? So if you might be a, and they, and they probably don't want somebody here, um, but if you're, yeah, if you're a legacy, meaning one or both of your parents, maybe grandparents went to that school, and it really helps your legacy piece if there's a, a history of giving to the school that they can see, uh, yeah, they will, they will, they'll allow a kid that's a little bit behind those. Is it more than a little bit? Right, right. Or something that might donate a building. Um, yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> they're going to make a building. Yeah. yeah. They call those felony cases. That's yeah. 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 Who else in a school like USC? Who, what, 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 sports. Sports, absolutely. Of course, right? They're going to they're gonna move the goalposts for their new quarterback. Uh, who might be back there. Um, but they, we're talking people that really excel. In athletics, and, and I don't want to just focus on USC. For any of these schools, you usually want to be really exceptional, whether that's as a musician, an artist, different different areas. You you, uh, you need to be well, not just the best in your high school, um, for them to make a real exception for you. To, to, to truly be special in that area. All right, so that's one behind the curve. This is in the middle of it, and then the last case I want to look at is when you're above those academic standards. And again, this this zone exists at all of these different selective high schools, it just moves a little bit based on that school. So any given kid, um, let's, let's, uh, what's your son or daughter's name? Matthew. Matthew. Uh, so for Matthew, at one, at one school with the same numbers, he might be behind the, behind the curve, and that's a little bit of a reach for him. And then he also needs a couple schools on his list where he's ahead of the curve, where it's highly likely he's going to get in, and we refer those as, as safeties, and then a couple in between that would be right in the middle. Um, that's what they refer to as a balanced list when we're applying to schools. One of the big reasons you want to have a balanced list is, uh, number one, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of green and blue up here. Um, so you, when you're ahead of those academic standards, it's much more likely you're going to be accepted. The other thing is that, uh, do you remember what the blue dots were? So they were accepted. They didn't go there. But they went somewhere else. USC does not like that. None of these schools no. want to, they, they don't, when they offer uh, a spot at their school, they want you to say yes. And USC, and that's why I like using this as the, as the, the example school, they really took this uh, practice to a new level, which was offering merit-based financial aid in order to entice students to go to their school. And so this is completely independent of, of need. Uh, merit aid is just based on at the end of the day, how much they, they want you. Um, but a lot of that comes down to GPA and SAT, ACT scores. 
or they'll usually add an interview or some supplemental pieces to it. Uh, but USC, they've got a, a, a presidential scholarship that's half off tuition for all four years. Um, because if, if, you're, if you're well ahead of this curve, they know you are applying to their competitors um, that might be ranked higher in that college rankings list. And, and though everybody says um, that those rankings should not matter, and they really truly shouldn't because Zaid and Matthew should have different lists on what makes sense for them, the reality is parents still do put importance on that. And so they, this, is, this is how they try to entice people to come to them. Uh, their trustee scholarship, which is pretty hard to get, it's 100% it's pretty clear tuition for four years. What a bloody fortune at USC uh, these days. So, uh, but I, it's not, it doesn't just exist at USC, uh, right? So, so maybe USC is a reach for a certain student. We also want to have some safeties where they're gonna, they're gonna really try to get a hold of that, um, that student. Questions on this? It gets easier after this. This is like data heavy slide. School like USC, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Most of it, yeah. And one of the one of the things I, I will uh, send these around. These are just uh, because often people want to ask about first of all the SAT and what's the scoring scale and how many sections are there. I don't want to eat up our time with some. But you can you can understand all that just by reading it quickly. Um, and so I am going to send those around so you understand the difference between the SAT and the ACT. And then this one um, just has, because inevitably people ask questions like that, which is, what's that range I need to be in at various schools? These are the, contains the, I think the top 100 schools now, the most, uh, uh, that have the most applications, and then just what those ranges are at each one of those schools. Um, and I will send those, I'll send those off. tell me how smart I am compared to everyone else. None of that is accurate. This is a test that can be studied for just like one in a history class or a calculus class, and that's why we have this big rise here. 
Uh, and I like the idea of telling students that they can take control of this part of the process because that's going to lower anxiety. And if they have that drive and that energy to try to improve their scores, that will open up more doors, more doors at more schools uh, and scholarship opportunities for those students. And just to, to uh, point out something here, so this right here, this is the same student in terms of GPA, but moving to a different spot on the graph every time just by virtue of improving that test score. And I, again, I think that's an empowering message because on any given day, you can move where you're at in terms of that test score. The older they get, the more and more baked in that GPA is. Um, but I, I, I like pushing this message out to kids that, hey, if you, if you want to do better on this test, you can. It really rewards hard work. And if they so decide to, to take the reins and, and put in that time and energy, they will improve on those tests without a doubt. Yes, sir. At what point when taking the test the first time, if they don't do well, will you need us to do it again? Like, we got to like a 28, and we might try it again and replace the other 34. Is it worth while trying to get a 36 or a difference between that? At what point do you say you let that off? Good question. There's a lot to discuss there. Number one, 28 is not a bad score. I know what it's like when you're in school like Paramount. Nobody talks about it if their kid scores a 20, but if somebody scores a 35, they tell everyone in the community they can possibly get a hold of. Um, so it feels like everybody's scoring in the top 1% of the, of the country, um, even though at, I, I, I know firsthand at any school, no matter how strong academic standards are, there are plenty of students that are scoring in the middle of the pack, at least initially. Uh, so let's, let's, let's put that out there, because we don't need we don't need to freak out if our, if our student happens to score 20 on the ACT or 1,000 on the SAT. Um, there's, there's plenty that can be done from there. It's not the end of the story. When, when do you know when you're done? If that's really the question, right? If you start, if you score to, let's say, a 20 and then move to a 26 and then to a 30, how do you know when you're done? I think it becomes clear, and there, there's always a point of diminishing returns. Um, when, we've, when we've overdone it with this. And I would suggest to anybody, now that there are uh, official exams that have been released out to the, to the public, um, and that's what, what we use when we test the kids to figure out where they're currently at, you don't have to take an official exam just to find out where you're scoring. You might as well take one of these decommissions. It used to be uh, a real test. Um, and we do it every Saturday and Sunday in Newport Beach for anybody in Orange County. And if, and if you ever heard me speak anywhere you're at Paramount, we'll do it 100% for free for your um, students. Just so it's an easy thing we can do for everybody in the Orange County community that, um, that we come in contact with. And, uh, and find out where you're currently scoring. Um, I think as you move through that prep process, there's, there's a point where you just start to see it. The scores will rise, they'll rise, and then you find out what you're what your ceiling uh, tends to be. Um, I can never guess. I mean, there are plenty of kids that have blown my mind uh, in terms of they went, I, I certainly thought, oh yeah, right, I, the kid's not gonna score higher than name, you know, whatever score, and they will blow right through that and keep on going. Um, a lot of it is down to how much that kid decides they really want it for themselves. Um, and so for me, I think that just as important as teaching the content is focusing on the motivational aspect. What does, again, who are you, where do you want to go? And so why, how does this test figure into that? Why should you put in time rather than just because somebody told you? Um, and if, if they click it, if, if that insight happens, they go, oh, I want to go design video games one day. And if I score higher on this test, I can get into that school where I get to go to learn how to do that. Magical things happen, not just on the test, but in their life, in school. They start to understand that, that whole process of setting goals, working hard, moving towards those goals. Um, I mean, I, we've seen spillover into um, athletics, uh, just all kinds of different aspects of their lives once they get, get into that process of, of leading into improvement. Um, and the tests are powerful because every kid, at least at the beginning, thinks it is some kind of intelligence test. When you break that down and they see that it isn't, Good, good things really happen. This is just a, an example. Uh, it has a few different options on there of when to take your test. Um, I think the uh, few rules of thumb, everybody accepts SAT or ACT. Every single 
of the 2,000 plus four year accredited colleges across the United States, they all take Ivy mm -hmm. tests. So I don't want anybody to study for both of them. I want each individual kid to figure out which one they are better at, and then you focus on that one exam. Where's that SAT, ACT flyer? The other one. Did you run out? Oh, I don't know. Right, so we got the SAT, the ACT, just to give it a visual. I want to figure out, the first thing I want to do, am I as a student better at the SAT or the ACT? Once I've identified which test I'm a little bit better at, I just run with that exam for the rest of my uh, time in while I'm in high school. Uh, and the reason for that is, as you can imagine, you're going to do better on that one exam by pouring all your energy into that rather than spreading it over two different tests. Um, and there is no college that wants both tests. I know there's somebody in this room that thinks that would be the secret ingredient to getting into X school. It will not. They will take both scores. And maybe you will still get in, but that's not the reason. Uh, the colleges just want to see the highest single score any student can give them. Mostly because it's in their selfish interest to compute students as high as possible with, with a score, because that figures into the whole rankings game. Um, and, the, and all of those colleges are definitely playing it because there's so, there's so much um, money and prestige attached to those, to those rankings. Yeah. So how does the student decide whether the SAT or the ACT is more appropriate for them? Great question. Did so, and, and that leads to this part right here. So you want to start this planning process at the end of sophomore year. Yeah. Too late. <laughs> oh, it's okay. Okay. Sorry. The live stream isn't picking up the audio perfectly. Would you mind? Yeah, I'm glad to hear there are some people. Yeah, there's, there's nothing I can do. There's live there's stream. Video. I can move it closer if that's all right. Oh, yeah, that's sure. Thank you. Let's do that. Right. And, and that PSAT, I think freshman year and sophomore year, it's not going to have any impact on their admissions chances. It's just a great experience to get used to going through those official exams. What's that? Oh, good. good. <laughs> but there's no PACT. And there is a, it's called the pre-ACT, but it's not, neither of the tests are 100% accurate, and the pre-ACT is a little less accurate than the PSAT. So it's fine to skip that as a, it's fine to use it as a school, it's fine to skip it as a school. Um, what you really want to do, the PSAT is, is accurate enough. We've got that score, right? You took that sophomore year. Either during your sophomore year or in the in the early summer, right after sophomore year ends, a mock ACT, and I would recommend a full length one just to really, really be accurate and find out exactly where they're scoring. Um, and again, uh, we'll do that for free for any Fairmont students that just want to find out where they're at on that on that ACT. If they also want to take a mock SAT, take a pair of full length versus a full length, we will do that. Or one of our people where they're they know exactly what they're doing to, to help parents understand how does my PSAT score that they took earlier in the year compared to an ACT score that they took at the end of the year, we can make those adjustments and help each family figure out which test is best for them. Yes. I have two questions. So um, the SAT is banned as part of a five years, right? It's, it, what's that? The SAT test itself, the score is good for five years. It's it's good. I mean, you have it, it's, you, can, you can pull up your scores now from no, I know. 20 years ago. Yes, yes. Um, but for the current case, right, they could take the SAT, SAT earlier. What's, oh, yes. What is the duration for which the ACT score is good? I don't know that. Oh, sure. I mean, if you take it any time in high school, you can submit that to a college. Okay. It's, it's not going to expire. And, and there are always exceptions to the rule. There are certain students that need to start that process earlier or they can start it earlier because they happen to be naturally really strong at the tests. And, and all I would say to any of those exceptions is check with your counselors, if that makes sense. Take a, again, a mock ACT exam so you don't have to use an official one and just see where they're scoring. If they are actually scoring near where you want them to eventually score, then, then it's fine to test early. And maybe or even can, the opposite, right? If you want, but that's right. Right. I'm asking because 
a bunch of us got our freshman notes. Right. So we have some time. Now, fr freshman year, I would just say, I, I know you want to do something to get the ball rolling. Here, here's what you can do that is not test prep. Encourage those kids to read for pleasure. That I, if I could just get every student here to read to read for pleasure, by the time they are a junior, these tests will be so much easier for them. And the reason is the math, the grammar, the science section on the ACT, all of this is highly teachable. Critical reading is, is also teachable, but it takes, it takes a bit longer to teach someone how to read faster for a higher level of retention. What we found the key variable was those students that are that just naturally like to read. And so that's why I really don't, I don't care what they're reading, eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th grade, if they will just read something else for pleasure and get into that, it is so much easier to teach them those critical reading skills. Yeah, I mean, um, that's a battle. It, it is a battle, um, <laughs> but it's, it's, you know, it's good for their brains, it's good for school, it's really just a win-win across the board. Um, I do have a second okay. question. Okay. So in the SAT, I know there are some subject tests some kids take for some schools. Yes. So what does the equivalent to the ACT? Right, okay, so, and that part gets a little, tricky let's um let's do this let me let me knock this guy out right here and then we're going to go to the subject test uh right here may or june you want to take at least two official exams and the reason for that is, is super scoring which is becoming more and more prevalent at at more and more colleges each each year which is that on either exam the college will cherry pick individual section scores and combine them like you did it all in one day. So let's go to, let's say Matthew here. He scores really high on the reading section and the science section of the ACT the first time he takes it. Not so well on the English and math. But the next time he takes it, English and math are higher and reading and science are a little lower. They would take these two highest scores and these two highest scores and combine them as though he did it all on one day. Um, and that's what a super score is. Now, different colleges have different policies with this. They don't even always publish it on their website how they interpret um, those scores in terms of super scoring. All you really need to know in terms of the action steps you need to take, if you, when you look at your students' SAT scores or ACT scores, if they would be higher as a result of sending in two scores as a, a, in order to create a super score, by all means, send both of them to all the colleges you are applying to. It's a real simple, clean, answer to that. Uh, but I, that is, that's a big advantage if you know about that versus if you don't, so I want to make sure we're clear on that one. Okay. Another, another tidbit is that essay at the end, there's an essay at the end of the SAT and the ACT. Always take, uh, always complete the essay at the end of the exam, but know that it is not horribly, it's, it, it's not going to make a big difference in terms of their application. Um, unless they're a journalism major or the website says like we really value the ACT optional essay. Uh, the reason you want to make sure to complete that essay every time is that when, since we have some fraud going on with personal statements, now the personal statement you send to a college is very important. Um, and as they become more and more wary of did a kid really write this or did they bring in some adult to do it or 80% of it, the one way they can check is that, oh, we had Johnny trapped in a room for 45 minutes where he had to write an essay. Over here, he sounds like the second coming of William Shakespeare. Over here, he can't connect two sentences together. Something's not right. Uh, and so that's what they're using. Again, I'm talking about the optional essay, the optional essay at the end of the standardized test. That's what they're using that for. They're not really looking at, oh, they, he scored an eight or a nine. They're, they're not as concerned about the scores. They're, it's just if they're worried about the authenticity of the personal statement. So that's why you want to go ahead and do that essay every time. Um, and it is it is optional. Your kids will say, I already, I already did it once. I don't want to have to do it again. Do it every time. Just, just do it every time. Okay, and we have a question about subject tests. Okay, so the subject tests, essay, the makers of the SAT also make subject tests. And it is easy to get lost in the weeds on subject tests. It's very individualized person. The simple answer is as you approach uh, junior year, your counselor is going to let you know if you need to take subject tests and which ones would be a good idea. They, so these subject tests are 60 minute tests that are on individual subjects like advanced math, 
world history, US history, uh, physics, chemistry, biology, they're more, the content tends to be more difficult than what is found on the two, uh, on the SAT and the ACT. They line up very closely with AP classes that students might be taking. So as um, junior or even sophomore year, as, as you get into the spring, and if a student is doing well in an AP class that lines up with one of those subject tests, that can be a good time to go take it uh, and on this, uh, this May or June sitting to take one of those subject tests. Um, and it's not a bad idea to go ahead and do it junior year. You don't have to send those scores to colleges if you don't like how that turns out. Um, so if they're in an AP class that lines up, it won't require a lot of extra preparation to get ready for that subject test yeah. as well. Um, there are fewer and fewer colleges that require the subject tests every year, but some of them are still very, very popular schools, and so um, the, the subject tests have not gone away just yet. Um, even, though, even though we're down I think to roughly 25 colleges in the country that are actually requiring between one and three of those subject tests. Uh, but that one I would really check in with it. your individual counselor at your high school. You guys have great counselors here because um, if I try to give universal answers, it's uh, it just it gets very individualized. Well, I have a question. Yes. So if they don't take the subject test, they won't be eligible at college? Is it a prerequisite? It's for certain that. colleges or certain majors. It may be, there, there, there are several engineering programs. So if you're, a, uh, let's say, if, if you're applying to any other major within the college, they will not be required. And this is what I mean by how it gets very individualized. But if you're an engineering major, they can say, hey, we need to see a science and the uh, math to advanced uh, subject test toward, from the SAT subject test. And so that's, that's where, you, again, you just want to be in touch with your counselor who will, who will say, um, yes, you, you're going to need this, or you might need this, so go ahead and do it. Uh, and you can, you, you can usually find that on, on various colleges' websites that you're interested in as well. And anybody that wants these slides, I will email them to you, so you, the, I don't want you to feel like you need to um, uh, take pictures. You can take pictures, it's fine, but you don't have to. Um, and anybody up here on the live stream, because I don't have a way for you to write down your email, if you send an email that info, that's info at prepgurus.com, uh, someone will email you these slides as well, just so you have that information too. So weird because I'm talking to another. <laughs> I have a question. I'm going yes. more to our school than to you. Sure. In your handout, there's a thing about converting the PISA into kind of a uh, ACT score. I mean, I, I'm sure I'm going to get lost. So, will that counselors be able to kind of help with the translation? Um, either the counselors can, um, and the first step would be asking the counselor. The other thing you can do, like what I did was, I sent a representative um, from from his office, um, the PSAT, okay. to say, hey, here's about what it would be, take a practice ACT, and that's kind of what he's saying. We have that PSAT, right. which can kind of convert to the SAT, right? It's kind of a predictor, pretty good, right? And so then take a practice ACT, compare the two, look and see. And then I was like, oh, well, this one looks fine. And <laughs> the person was like, no, have her do, you know, have her do this one. So, um, and, and then they can, they can do that. So you can definitely ask the counselor, but um, our counselors focus a lot on those college admissions. And so the specific test questions, you know, being able to relate to someone, which is definitely why we wanted to bring um, Nick in so that we have that, you know, direct communication. Sure. Fairmont's so generous in offering the PSAT to freshmen, sophomores, juniors. Yes. Is there any chance that we can get a mock ACT here for a test? So it's a, for the kids? Wonderful, Charlotte, you asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> Nick has been begging me for about six months. Um, so we, um, in the past, we have offered uh, practice tests on the weekends um, through uh, various groups. Um, we haven't in the last few years because the attendance wasn't, um, uh, it wasn't something that parents um, were very interested in. Um, however, that being said, um, after we do this, we will continue to reach out to you because what we would like to offer is um, a support 